corresponding to Kiev and to friends uh, in Germany and abroad. Welcome to our today's very timely discussion on the developments in Ukraine's anti-corruption field and judiciary. My name is Mattia Nellis and I'm a program director at the Center for Liberal Modernity, LibMod, a Berlin-based think tank founded by Ralph Fuchs and Marie-Louise Beck in 2017. We at LibMod have several Ukraine-related projects, and uh, today's discussion is part of our Ukraine in Europe project, which is a parliamentary advisory project kindly supported and financed by the German Foreign Ministry. And most of the project focuses on strengthening the expertise, the know-how and the networks of Ukraine's parliament and even its parliamentary culture to a certain extent by connecting its deputies with, and their staffers, especially with European experts and politicians on selected EU German Ukraine uh, issues. Today is not directed at the Rada, but quite the opposite direction is directed towards Berlin. And um, as we are speaking in English, also to international friends and partners of Ukraine. So as you know, it's the topic is anti-corruption and judiciary, which seems like a, a niche topic, but in the case of Ukraine, where corruption until recently was the uh, norm rather than the exception, it is an extremely important field. I cannot emphasize this more enough to um, also assess how far the country has gotten in realizing its post-Maidan and Maidan aspiration of becoming a normal European state based on the rule of law. So since the revolution of dignity 2014, um, 13, 14, the country has come a long way and uh, in combating corruption and partially restructuring its judiciary. Today, we will not be able to explain the progress but we will zoom into some of the main achievements and explain how they are under threat and uh, try to make sense of what this means also for Ukraine's relations with the West. And we're delighted to discuss the developments in the field of corruption and judiciary with two current Ukrainian MPs, one former MP and one representative of Ukraine civil society, as well as Marie Louise Beck, all of whom I will introduce separately. But our today's discussion will be opened by Tetiana Shevchuk, who is a legal expert at the uh, Anti-Corruption Action Center in Ukraine, which is one of the country's main anti-corruption civil society organization, which provides crucial insights and analysis. I can only recommend you to follow the Ukrainian or English uh, newsletter, which Tetiana also edits. And uh, Tetiana focuses on anti-corruption and judiciary reforms. And she will kind of frame our debate with a kind of, with, um, insights on what happened in the past weeks. And afterwards, we're going into a political discussion on the repercussions of the developments and, and also ask what they mean for Ukraine and Western relations. So Tetiana, um, please shed uh, some light on the recent developments. In our introduction, we've alluded to the developments, but just know and be mindful that not all viewers know all the technical terms. So um, you don't need to explain all, everything from scratch, but please use as few technical expressions as possible. And afterwards, we'll come to the political discussion. So Tetiana, the floor is yours. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Matia. Good morning, dear colleagues. Um, I am entrusted with a very complicated task to explain all the developments uh, of our anti-corruption reforms in a few seconds. Um, so no, not to waste the time, um, I will uh, explain what we have now and uh, what is uh, what are the main issues we are struggling with? Uh, so in recent years, Ukraine created quite a comprehensive, um, what we call uh, anti-corruption infrastructure, uh, which is aimed to tackle the grand political corruption and corruption mostly on all levels. Uh, so it consists of uh, National Agency on Prevention of Corruption and uh, the bodies that should prosecute corruption. It's Anti-Corruption Bureau, which, uh, which you call NABU, which should investigate corruption, uh, Special Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office, uh, which, is we call, which we call SAPO, uh, which should help NABU to bring cases to the court and represent uh, the government in the trial as prosecutors, uh, and Specialized Anti-Corruption Court, which is called HAC, so Anti-Corruption Court just. Uh, so it's like a, a structure that uh, all in in one should uh, bring their uh, corrupt people to the justice, starting from the investigation to the final verdict of the court. 
Um, it took like five years to establish everything. Um, when President Zelensky uh, uh, was in the, in the election cycle, when he came to the power, he actually came to the power with a big promise of not just fighting corruption, as he said, he said, we will conquer the corruption. And uh, uh, during the first half a year of his tenure, of the tenure of newly elected parliament, it's actually what was happening. Uh, uh, the newly, uh, the newly uh, elected uh, parliament um, helped to eradicate the obstacles, um, the legal obstacles which were preventing NABU from uh, their effective work, like giving them wiretapping powers or uh, pre uh, uh, eliminating some obstacles in the work of anti-corruption court. Uh, uh, they help to limit their jurisdiction to focus only on grand political corruption and so forth and so on. Uh, but uh, during the last half a year, uh, we've seen um, uh, the abrupt change of the mood in the government, not only uh, in terms of anti-corruption, but in general. But with this abrupt change of the government and their, their rhetorics, narratives, and the way they operate, uh, we see not the support of their um, anti-corruption bodies, but the attempts to put them under political control. Uh, by design, those anti-corruption bodies were made to be independent, both on the operational level and mainly politically. So they have complicated uh, procedures of uh, selecting a head of the bodies, like a director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, head, the chief prosecutor of special, specialized anti-corruption prosecutor's office, those to make this body politically independent, dependent and be able to prosecute top level corruption. Uh, what we see now, like back, coming back to a very narrow time period, just during the last months, we see a big attack on National Anti-Corruption Bureau and Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office. It's not that it was not happening before, but at this moment, this happens simultaneously. Um, for, as for the NABU, uh, their Constitutional Court of Ukraine uh, issued two rulings uh, on unconstitutionality of appointment of director and the procedure uh, in the law of now. Firstly, the the, uh, according to Ukrainian constitutional tradition and Ukrainian law, constitutional court actually cannot review individual appointments. Uh, so it was unprecedented move from the constitutional court to find the appointment of Artem Sitnik as director of NABU unconstitutional. And we see this as a political decision because there, uh, besides their fact of the decision, their writing of the ruling is so unclear that puts um, the bureau as independent body to the kind of uh, um, legal limbo. Nobody knows what to do next and uh, what uh, actions would be legal and complying with constitution. So uh, with these rulings, uh, we now have to wait for the decision of RADA, where we have a um, ma majority of for servants of the people, which is supported by their opposition party and a lot of a lot of other um, anti-Western, uh, pro-Russian politicians, uh, pro-oligarchic politicians uh, who are not interested in independent institution, who are interested in putting into the under political control or making it totally unoperational or destroying it uh, to the fullest. So now we're waiting for this political decision of the Rada. And it could be very dangerous because uh, uh, either the procedure of uh, nominating new director would be politicized under the law, or during this period when the Rada decides on, on the new procedures, on the new director, they have uh, the right to and the possibility uh, to appoint interim director uh, uh, without any uh, pre-selection, without any compliance with integrity criteria, with professionalism criteria, with good reputation criteria. And thus, uh, uh, the body which is legally independent would be under effective political control. Uh, and uh, it's not unprecedented. So, uh, it's something we have already seen with other law enforcement body in Ukraine, which is uh, State Bureau of Investigation, 
the, uh, it's almost a year. We are waiting for appointment of new director of this law enforcement agency. And it's still interim director uh, who didn't pass any pre-selection procedures and uh, has a uh, doubtful reputation. Um, this may happen with uh, NABU, which is unacceptable uh, to guarantee its independence and uh, uh, being fair to all political parties. So uh, if NABU uh, comes under political control, it can become an instrument for political persecution of enemies of the ruling party and their people who control the majority in the parliament. Um, this is a story about NAMU, but uh, simultaneous story uh, happens with Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office. Uh, it didn't uh, come under, under scrutiny from the constitutional court or from legal part, but um, the contract and the term of office of previous head of uh, a prosecution office expired. And uh, at the moment, effectively, there is no uh, head of SAPO. Uh, so uh, their procedural control, the, uh, the procedural powers uh, over the office are in the hands of uh, prosecutor general. Uh, technically, the law provides that uh, SAPO should be independent from the head, like head office, prosecutor general office. Um, uh, but when there is no head of SAPO, uh, the interim, uh, SAPO head is uh, Prosecutor General. And uh, uh, current Prosecutor General Irina Venediktova uh, is uh, not uh, independent figure. As we've seen from her actions, uh, she, she is very reliable on the office of the president and is eager to uh, follow their commands. Um, so uh, we don't, so effectively SAPO is uh, under an indirect control of, of, the, of the president at the moment. Uh, but uh, so um, there, there should be the procedure of uh, selection of new SAPO head, uh, which again by the law um, is designed in the way um, to make it transparent. And um, I cannot say this, this, proce this procedure is not politicized because seven members of selection commission uh, are nominated by uh, Rada, by the parliament, uh, but still, uh, uh, the law prescribed that those people who are nominated to the selection commission should have experience in anti-corruption field, should have um, a reputation, um, and, uh, and should have um, a certain level of uh, personal integrity. Uh, uh, when we analyze the people who were pre-selected by RADA uh, back in uh, June, July, we see, we've seen that those people do not uh, comply with those criteria. So this was like random people, some people from um, uh, from around, I, I would say it's academia, but it's, they are not uh, uh, like reputable uh, scholars. Um, uh, and uh, the, some of them had uh, some unexplained assets and so on and so forth. Rada failed to nominate those uh, seven people, those commission, for two times, and just not, not, to, not, not just failed, but refused to. They didn't have enough votes from a uh, servant of the People Party because they understood that it's a huge scandal, it's a huge problem to have such a commission. So um, the remaining members of parliament, the office of the president, had to get additional votes from opposition, uh, uh, opposition bloc party, which is pro-Russian one, uh, pro-oligarchic forces like the Vera group for the future group, to push for this uh, questionable commission. So now we have seven of the members of the uh, SAPO selection commission who do not comply with the law. This puts their selection process under the risk that uh, the, the procedure would not be transparent, would not be um, uh, um, trusted by the people. And uh, either, so firstly, they would not guarantee the fair competition. Secondly, uh, they, uh, uh, the good people would not apply uh, for the position, seeing that their uh, competition is rigged at the beginning. And thirdly, they would just uh, fail all the good candidates and, pre and select uh, the somebody whom, who was pre-selected by the office of the president. Because there is already the rumor that uh, head of the office of the uh, president, Andriy Yermak, 
wants to see his uh, uh, good friend Andrei Kostin, who is current, currently MP and head of uh, uh, Judiciary Committee in the Parliament, as as uh, as a further uh, head of SAPO, meaning putting totally political appointee uh, to their office. Um, this is the situation we have now with all uh, all um, uh, their. Uh, NABU and SAPO situation. There are a lot other smaller nuances on how they try to attack integrity and operationability uh, of their uh, anti-corruption bodies, but in general it's the line of attack we uh, have at the moment. Thank you, Tatiana. That uh, is very important. I hope everyone could follow that, but um, the essence is both the investigative agency, the NABU, which has come up again and again is under threat, the integrity and independence of the NABU is under threat, as well as the person overseeing the investigations of the NABU, the office of the so-called specialized anti-corruption prosecutor. So both key, as Tatiana has pointed out very well, key links in the anti-corruption architecture. So let's now move to the um, political side of the discussion and bring in our other guests, and I want to begin uh, with Ma Marie Luisa, who's um, not just the co-founder of the Center for Liberal Modernity, but she's been in the parliament in the German Bundestag for over 30 years. And uh, since 2005, she focused extensively on Eastern Europe. And uh, Marie, you're following Ukraine's path for, for a long time, and you have a um, political message to our audience about the um, un unduly processes in Ukraine's judiciary. So please, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, to be open, my heart is bleeding. <laughs> um, yesterday, we had a dis uh, debate on Nord Stream 2. And uh, to be very open, I think this is a project which is betraying Ukraine. And I know that uh, the hopes from Ukraine very much lie on Germany and the Chancellor's office. And if you have big hopes um, in somebody who then is betraying you, uh, is very difficult. And I am German and we did not manage until now to stop that project. So um, this is what I wanted to say first. Number two, of course, and maybe it is a little, a little bit linked to um, this betraying, <laughs> is that there is many people who have been saying Ukraine is a lost case. Uh, I don't have to tell you about Russian propaganda. It is uh, perfect and unfortunately, and we can't talk about that tomorrow, today because uh, we would need more time. There is a very fertile ground in Germany, in the German population for Russian propaganda because there still is a lot of thinking um, Berlin and Moscow believe, belong together, forget about those in between. Um, so, having said this, of course, a, a strong performance of Ukraine would help a lot in order to explain in Germany and of course in Europe, because the music is not only playing in Germany, explaining in Europe, you really cannot betray this country. Uh, in the end, you are betraying yourself because it would be the end of Europe, of claiming that Europe is uh, making politics following values. Uh, the problem is that the Zelensky government started being a black box for Germany and it actually still remains being a black box. Um, when I think about Russia and I go into the uh, library, we have 
hundreds of books explaining us the background of the role of KGB, of which oligarchs are playing which role, of who is linked to Putin and what position and so on. We have a pretty clear picture of Russia. Until now, I do not find any publications which could help our way around uh, in Ukraine in this way. So my question number one is, who is playing which role in the back of what you are talking about now? Because obviously it is not by accident all those changes we are talking about now. Um, I think as long as this black box is being kept up, <clears throat> the support for your country will become weaker and weaker. Um, Europe is not, Europe is not um, sticking to its obligations. Look at Belarus, let's not talk about that. I'm ashamed about that also. But <clears throat> um, we need to a certain extent open this black box. Um, for me, and uh, there is not so many people, few, they're all here, I can see them, who have been going along with Ukraine for many years. Rebecca Harms is one of them also. Um, we still could not tell you, we still are asking who is Zelensky? What is driving him? Is he just a populist who is looking to the next elections and uh, not really having a strategic plan and jumping this way and that way? Or is there a strategic plan which slowly he's taking step by step? General persecutor, now Nabu, and so on and so on. Um, or is he really so naive that he does not know what he's doing and um, how much harm he does to the support he would need, the country would need to go through, through this very long time of transition. Definitely us in the so-called West have underestimated how long this um, a time of transition will be, how long it takes setting up institutions, who you can rely on. You can't send away all those people who have been part of the system before. We couldn't do that in 1949. Our NS judges were back in our judiciary system uh, after 49. So we know a little bit, but we had help from the outside. Uh, you must do it from the inside. So I think, yes, let's go on looking at the details of what is happening now. But actually my feeling is what we need is either have strong messages to Zelensky, which he really understands, because he does not want to give the country back into Putin's hand? Or is it that there is already decision and actually already a plan that Ukraine shall not become part of the West in, in the sense of EU, which mo would mean the end of oligarchy room at, at least to a certain extent. So this is my political questions. I don't know where they go to, whether they are too general, uh, Mattia, whether they go too deep, but this is what I can hand over from my side um, with, for all those people who are willing to go on working, who are burning for your country, but who are at the moment really sitting there being 
really a little stunned and not knowing where we can start digging at the moment. Um, I, I think we have to, to take into account Brussels, um, the uh, International Monetary Fund, like they did the, with the Kolomoisky Law, which worked. Um, yes, this is what we are discussing. And, and the problem is there is almost no parliamentarians anymore in Germany who know the country and who are interested in the country. Um, so you are more and more getting on your own. Um, this is one of the sad, more sad facts. I think Mattia, I see him nodding. This is what I can tell you. And if you want to ask me, just go ahead. Right. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much. We'll come back to her points, very crucial points, because I think one of the key messages is that Ukraine is in a shrinking space of attention for Ukraine in the West, whatever you can call it, whether you can call that or not. Ukraine is gambling with its remaining reputation. And we'll come back to the question what the West and the EU, Marie said Brussels and the IMF, can do. So this would be a key component of discussion. I want to turn to our parliamentarians who have been patiently waiting. Um, uh, and to unwrap some of the questions laid out here. So I want to begin with you, Nastya. Anastasia Radina. Ah, there you are. I see you. Perfect. The chairperson or chairwoman of the RADA's anti-corruption committee and member of the Sluhana Rodu faction in the RADA. I think I see a lot of fine anti-corruption experts here in the crowd and you all know Nastya. She's a well-known anti-corruption fighter and prior to joining the parliament, she was a, at Antakt, so she was a colleague of Tetiana, where she was until recently a head a member of the board. So Nastya, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to, to today's discussion. Thank you very um, much. Yeah. It's also yes, my pleasure being here. Um, I do still think of myself as a representative of civil society in the ruling party. I do still uh, feel myself as a close ally and fellow with the civil society, uh, close to the extent that I think Tatiana somehow got hold of my of notes for my speech and voiced them all. <laughs> so um, I will just uh, try to focus on some key issues. First, uh, I do not want uh, our, us and uh, the world in general to underestimate how much has been done in anti-corruption fight in Ukraine. So in past, uh, how many, six years, I think we did succeed in establishing full circle of anti-corruption institutions that are now started to bring results. Um, anti-corruption court, anti-corruption investigation, anti-corruption institution, the system of electronic asset declarations are right now putting an end to the whole era of untouchable people in Ukraine. Uh, the problem here is one, untouchable people, those who used to be untouchable are of course uh, not quite happy about that and are uh, fighting back as, uh, as strongly as they can. Uh, unfortunately, the result of that is basically that anti-corruption infrastructure is uh, as endangered as it has ever, ever been in Ukraine. Uh, as Tatiana, well, uh, I will uh, probably go back to uh, some issues Tatiana pointed, but before that, I would like to point the most important danger for anti-corruption institutions. Unfortunately, what I am seeing is that some uh, Ukrainian oligarchs have allied with pro-Russian forces in the parliament and outside the parliament in attacking anti-corruption institutions. Why they are doing that? Well, of course, because they want their impunity to be secure, but on, not only for that reason. What I am seeing um, is that it is quite understood that anti-corruption reform and anti-corruption institutions are uh, markers of uh, Ukraine's cooperation with the West. All anti-corruption institutions and mechanisms are conditionalities for uh, visa-free regime, for cooperation with uh, International Monetary Fund, for cooperation with European Union, for political support Ukraine receives uh, from uh, individual countries and from uh, Western world in general. And uh, those pro-Russian forces and oligarchs united, they understand that if they succeed in attacking anti-corruption institutions, this will uh, break Ukraine away from the civilized world and they hope this will contribute to Ukraine slowly drifting in the, uh, in the, in the hands of in 
welcoming, may I say, hands of Russian Federation. And of course, Russian Fed the plan of Kremlin for Ukraine has uh, nothing to do with establishing strong uh, rule of law institutions. Uh, this is something to keep in mind. At the same time, I have to say that uh, there are pro-European, pro-Western, pro-rule of law uh, forces in Ukrainian parliament. Uh, for example, at the Servants of the People, I, I can name at least uh, 30 plus prominent members of the parliament who do support, uh, uh, who do support reforms uh, that have been implemented and work for their promotion. I do think there are more people like that. When I'm saying uh, 30 plus, I'm only saying of those who have already vividly identified themselves. So um, by no means uh, is there no one to fight back oligarchs and uh, pro-Russian forces. However, I will have to say that uh, us pro-reform, pro, uh, pro pro-rule of law, pro uh, civilized world, may I put it like this, uh, forces in the parliament will need support and I will return to this, uh, to this message later. Why am I saying that anti-corruption institutions are as endangered as they have ever been? Of course, in past five years, we have seen all kinds of attacks on anti-corruption institutions, nothing new here. Uh, however, I can't remember a moment in time when all key anti-corruption institutions have been endangered under threat at the same time. Um, first of all, we are now in um, the, the we are now uh, in in the risk of reviewing the law on anti-corruption bureau. Um, it's probably at, at the risk is not a good wording for it. Uh, amendments to uh, to the law on anti-corruption bureau, the investigative body, are upon us because there has been a decision of constitutional courts that literally obliges uh, the parliament to uh, amend the law and make sure it is in line with the constitution. Uh, I want to point out one positive thing in this decision of the Constitutional Court, and that is that Constitutional Court still did not go as far as question the whole status of anti-corruption bureau. The Constitutional claim, again, from uh, pro-Russian forces in the parliament, asked the Constitutional Court to consider the whole status of anti-corruption bureau, and result of this consideration might have been putting a huge legal question mark on all uh, investigations of anti-corruption bureau. Uh, I'm delighted to say that the Constitutional Court did not go that far and uh, refused to, uh, to make any judgment as to the status of Anti-Corruption Bureau. However, we are now, um, we are now in need for uh, amendments, the selection procedure for head of Anti-Corruption Bureau. And here, of course, the question of preserving all the, in the, uh, all the competition-based appointment procedures and all the safeguards for independence of the institution. This, these uh, questions are on the table. And uh, as far as I can see, there might be, uh, softly saying a discussion on this issue in the parliament again because uh, people supported by oligarchs and uh, pro-russian forces are members of the parliament and will be part of that discussion as well um, at the same time of course i um, i'm afraid uh, some of colleagues uh, members of the parliament might use this amendment to uh, this upcoming amendments to the law on anti corruption bureau to get rid of current head of anti corruption bureau here i have to say that decision on unconstitutional nature of appointments in an in anti corruption bureau is not the first one we have had the same one on one uh, regulating body the one that establishes utility prices very similar decision what i have to point out that in that case the parliament still went for providing in the law that uh, chairperson of that regulating commission, despite unconstitutional nature of his appointment, stays for the end of his uh, legal term in office. I'm warning my colleagues that should we take different approach to uh, amending the law on anti-corruption bureau, we will, um, we will probably we um, will probably be accused of uh, political attack on anti-corruption bureau, which is something I at least would like to uh, would like to avoid. Uh, then, as to selection commission of special um, of the head of special anti-corruption prosecutor's office, I think Tatiana said enough. Again, a new person is about to be selected. Unfortunately, some uh, expected winners of this competition, the, their surnames are already voiced, even though uh, competition has not yet even started. So again, it is a huge uh, task for um, 
for the government, for selection commission, for all those who nominated members of the selection commission to make sure that selection goes impeccably. Uh, whether this will happen or not, we have yet to see. There are chances it will, but for that, of course, everyone involved needs to be very um, careful and reasonable in decisions they are making. Uh, then I have to say that uh, anti-corruption court, the one we have been fighting a lot for, the one I have been fighting a lot for be before becoming a member of the parliament, is also questioned in the constitutional court. Uh, hearing on this issue is upcoming and we will have to see what decision of the constitutional court uh, will be and uh, whether the constitutional court will have this uh, political and may even say state building wisdom of not putting the whole institution in danger. Uh, again, some elements of uh, uh, electronic declarations for public officials are questioned in the constitutional court. Uh, newly, um, newly re-established criminal liability for illicit enrichment, the one I have been fighting for a lot in the parliament and the one which I uh, consider to be one of the successes of the servants of the people in terms of uh, uh, anti-corruption fight. Unfortunately, the illicit enrichment crime is also questioned in the Constitutional Court and we will have to see how, how, how this develops. Um, to end up, okay. I would like to return to my previous message as to the help that pro-European and pro-reform, uh, pro pro-Western pro forces in the parliament need. Um, when I'm saying we need support, I actually mean for 67% uh, of Ukrainians who uh, see Ukraine's choice with uh, Europe. Unfortunately, again, we are uh, against pro-Russian forces who have money, who have control of TV channels, who have every opportunity to impose their narrative. And against them are like groups of fairly young people with uh, no, uh, no proper media resource. Uh, I have to say, in my opinion, I think it is time the European Union uses the leverage it has, the leverage of micro financial assistance, the leverage of uh, political and diplomatic assistance that uh, um, is given to Ukraine. Um, my feeling is that if this leverage is uh, neglected at this stage, uh, there will be simply no more leverage was this government for as long as this government stands that that that's probably it thank you nastia this is a very important contribution i cannot underscore how important it is and also um you belong to the people within sluha who really try to advance change and have succeeded partially um so i want to underline just one point because nastia has emphasized the uh, importance of the selection process of, NAB, of NABU, which is now being challenged. And NABU's uh, selection process in 2015 is an example, an exemplary selection process where under the participation of international experts, but Ukrainian commission, uh, largely Ukrainian, has selected really fine uh, people with impeccable reputation and professional background. So this is key. So if you touch this, you touch to the very essence of, of, NAB, uh, of NABU and its integrity and independence. Now, Yaroslav, another MP, you're, you're Chishin, you've been patiently listening and waiting for your chance to comment. You are not just another MP, you are also an outstanding anti-corruption activist or warrior in a sense, because prior to joining the RADA uh, for the Holos or Go Voice Party in the opposition, you were head of the Transparency uh, International chapter of Ukraine. So you know uh, Ukraine's anti-corruption fight extremely well. Maybe you want to come in and add on what Nastya has said, but maybe you can expand on her last point uh, towards the end of your statement regarding international pressure. Yaroslav, the floor is, is yours. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I agree totally with uh, Tanya and Nastya in uh, describing the scenario what we have now in Ukraine. Uh, the most um, dangerous for us that we don't have possibility to develop uh, reform. Now we fight it to save what we uh, prepared previously. And this fighting become more and more active uh, because our uh, pro-oligarch and pro-Russia troops have become more and more influential. And uh, first of all, I, I agree that uh, we still have possibility uh, to use, um, sorry for this direct uh, uh, meaning, but really use our international, uh, your international help uh, to us, uh, because uh, 
uh, our government pretend as previously Poroshenko pretends to, to use your health without uh, any results. So uh, if uh, we will use mechanism, Ukraine show result in, and only after that uh, have some help from your uh, you side, from the side of EU members, it can help us really. Why? Because uh, majority of Ukrainian pro-European, pro-Western, and really want to see result of reform and want to see how uh, government fighting, uh, combating with uh, corruption more effectively. Uh, but I want to answer for the question of uh, Maria Louise Beck, uh, who is Mr. Zelensky, and why we now we have so dangerous inflation on WAM and on situation in Ukraine uh, from the side of pro-Russia troops and oligarch troops. So uh, Zelensky is uh, empty uh, creature. Uh, it's, it's really a handmade uh, uh, politician, politician from people, politician from TV, uh, and who near them create a plan to Ukraine. So previously we have uh, uh, Andrei Bogdan, who was uh, closest affiliators. Uh, he was close with Kolomoisky, but he clearly understand that possibility to, to develop, to, res to, to have result have direct connection with Western. So because of that, uh, we have uh, very active communication with our Western partners. Uh, we have new team in Ukrabron Prom. We have um, some, we, we try to push forward judiciary reform uh, to give some additional possibility to anti-corruption structure uh, to, uh, repair some mistake which was done before previously in the end of Poroshenko time, but uh, after dismissing of uh, Bogdan and dismissing of uh, Gonchiruk uh, government, uh, we can criticize Gonchiruk government for their unprofessionality or maybe uh, not uh, so strategic view uh, which this government proposed to country, but we uh, we can agree as a position that it was pro-Ukrainian government, pro-Western government. Maybe not so professional, but okay, still. Uh, now we have totally pro-Russia and pro-oligarch uh, government. We have uh, head of government who previously worked in the structure of uh, Akhmetov, who one of the most influential oligarchs. Uh, we have position uh, of Kolomoisky who proposed not work with West, but work with Russia, take money from Russia, it's more easy at, without any obligation. Just uh, take money and, uh, and, 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 and we will have peace. And now we have strange situation when the head of Office of President, Yermak, invite in Minsk uh, three side peace uh, group. Uh, people who have direct connection with Russia. Uh, Mr. Fokin, who is a deputy uh, head of Ukrainian side of Minsk group, uh, previously was uh, prime minister of Ukraine in, in the beginning of 19, 19th. And um, uh, the main, his goal was create uh, um, uh, economic uh, uh, unity between Russia, Belarus and uh, Ukraine. Uh, and in, in the beginning of uh, 90s. Now he announced all per Russia position, uh, but from Ukrainian side. And uh, it's uh, uh, really dangerous for us. Why? Because Russia showed that, okay, Ukrainian uh, agree with us uh, and Ukrainian officials uh, agree with us. And when we ask office of president does, it's uh, the private position of Hawking. Uh, yes, President Office said, yes, it's private position, but still they uh, let them talk, let them represent Ukraine on, uh, Minsk, in, in a Minsk process. So uh, Yermak are uh, quite pro-Russia and uh, very corrupt uh, officials uh, because he have a, a huge uh, influence on Zelensky. We have 
many problems uh, now in the sphere of fighting with corruption and in the sphere of fighting with Russia. So now we have like uh, uh, unity between pro-Russia and oligarchs troops in, uh, in Ukraine. And because of that, uh, we have re frozen judiciary reforms. Uh, now we're waiting for estimation of the Venice Commission uh, from a draft of law from the president's side, but it's a disaster because this draft of law don't give any further uh, movement for, for judiciary reform. They try to frozen all process and give possibility to high qualification commission of judges and Supreme Council of Court uh, try to 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 uh, stop any possibility to 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 reform this fear. And the same situation as described my colleagues, uh, uh, we have in anti-corruption sphere, but not only in anti-corruption institution. We have returning many people from Yanukovych time. Uh, on the position uh, of head of state uh, industries. We, uh, we see how many people from Yanukovych time return in government. So yes, uh, it's uh, beginning of uh, revenge. It's not like a nightmare, it's reality. Uh, but uh, in the same time, I totally agree with the NAST, uh, majority of Ukrainian society is still pro-Western, still waiting for reforms. Uh, but um, we can lose this possibility to, to, to use this unity of society. Why? Because uh, so, lo uh, so long period without any results, uh, it's uh, made uh, a situation really unpredictable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for these also political remarks. I want to bring in the last um, um, speaker and then we open the floor. I think uh, we have another 20 to 30 minutes and I really want you to, get, uh, to have the opportunity to ask our stellar speakers questions. But lastly, uh, um, I want to bring in Sehi Leshenko, who's a former MP and investigative journalist who now uh, writes his Telegram channel and is a, T a Kiev Post a political commentator, but a Kiev Post also columnist and supervisory board member of Ukra Zalesnitsa. So Sehi, uh, Privit, are you are you there? I can't see you yet. Sehi, you're muted. If not, if, Se if we lost Sehi, we'll give a couple of minutes for him to come back. So I will give you the opportunity in the meantime to ask to signal either with a virtual hand in Zoom or to in the chat to ask questions to the speakers. So gather your thoughts and say he last chance. No, I think we, we lost Sehi. So while you prepare he your there. first. So he is there, but uh, he can't unmute himself. He is there. Sehi. But he can't speak, we can't hear you. We can't hear you just yet. Okay. Then um, I want to come back to uh, do a follow up while we wait for say Yaroslav because the question of the, what the West can do, everyone has touched upon that. And there were several very strong signals to Zelensky in the past and the government of Shmichal in the past weeks, really clear signals. G7, EU, IMF, there was a, like a, a bombardment of signals. And um, so far, the signals are being ignored and they move ahead. So how do you, Tatiana mentioned the threat and um, Nasty also of visa liberalization, but how do you assess the threat of Ukraine-EU relations? Should these signals be ignored? Maybe you could explore uh, that thought a little bit further, Yaroslav. You are muted. Or if, if, if not you, maybe Tatiana or someone else wants to jump in. Really, the question is, how endangered are Ukraine and EU relations? I believe that the, actually all these developments we have, uh, their aim, this, this consolidated attacks of pro-Russian forces, uh, oligarchs, top corrupt officials, uh, the cons this consolidated attack we see, uh, their aim is uh, to attack Ukraine-EU uh, relations, Ukraine uh, relations with Western allies, uh, because uh, uh, these relations mean that Ukraine has to develop itself in, towards rule of law, towards 
a democratic standards towards fight with corruption. And these people do not like this. And uh, of course, maybe they have on every one of them, each one had their own like smaller goals, but breaking this unity with uh, EU is a primary goal. And uh, Anastasia, maybe you can bring you back in. We have a Ukraine EU summit coming up. So what is the political message you want the EU to clearly articulate vis-a-vis -vis, um, your own government? Let, let me put it like this. I'm investing lots of time and effort to make the uh, whole mechanism of uh, of monitoring and uh, of monitoring whether conditionalities for visa free regime and the suspension mechanism to make this mechanism clear and understandable for my colleagues. I'm explaining colleagues that although, of course, visa free regime and cooperation we, we, with Europe will not uh, stop, let's put it like this, tomorrow or next week, there are conditionalities, there are criteria that we need to follow. Uh, if we don't, then EU has no other choice as to uh, implement procedures that have been established by the EU for, for the situation. Unfortunately, I have to say that uh, some of the colleagues uh, and, uh, of course, many media resources present this uh, concerns on, of co cooperation with Europe as uh, exaggerated, as uh, playing in the benefit of certain political, uh, political actors as being a pre-election technology even. I think what we do need is uh, assistance and help in delivering a message as to how suspension mechanisms works in no means uh, by no means of course I'm asking to do something that endangers visa free regime because this works for the benefit for Uk of Ukrainian people but I think it is high time uh, colleagues in the parliament in the government decision makers do understand how the whole suspension mechanism works and this uh, explanation fortunately or unfortunately I think has to come from uh, from uh, the EU in a rather uh, straightforward, if I may put it like this way, uh, to make sure my colleagues do not do anything from our side that endangers visa-free regime and uh, moves us as far as to the verge of uh, considering uh, negative results of monitoring and even suspension mechanism. This has to be made clear, uh, made clear to the colleagues. Thank you. Not, so this is a signal to us, to the West, uh, to not just do more for more, but maybe even uh, withdraw some of the aspects that we are offering in, in case there's uh, significant step backs. Okay, I'm looking at, do I see any virtual hands or unmute yourself if you have a question. Sehi, are you with us now? I see you rejoined. Or if not, uh, Willem, I, do you want to ask a question? If not, I will continue. So I give you the opportunity to intervene. No? Okay, Amari Louise Beck, I see virtual hand raising. Uh, if is that the case? If that is the case, unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Do you hear Hello. me? Yes, we can hear you. Please introduce Hello. yourself. Yes. <laughs> no. Well, Willem Aldershoff, former head of Unit European Commission in Brussels, now um, analyst international affairs, dealing with Ukraine since a very long time. Of course, very many important things. I think we lost your audio. <laughs> Willem, we can't hear you, or am I the only one not hearing him? The joys of Zoom. Sorry? We lost you. Please repeat the question. Um, if everybody who spoke could please reply to the question of Maria Luisa about the black box. We lost you again, but I assume you're referring to Marie Louise Beck's question regarding the black box, William. We lost you. The audio signal, we just heard comment and black box. So yes. um, uh, maybe I can rephrase this and play, uh, play it back. Um, Sehi Leshenko, are you? Yes. Do you hear me now? Ah, Sehi, there, there you are, finally. So um, there was a question regarding, uh, uh, regarding uh, black box of Zelensky. And of course, this is a huge question, but I want to introduce you properly now that you're with us 
uh, obviously people people know you. Uh, some some are criticizing you for being too close to the uh, Zelensky government. I should say this up front. We always get criticism for putting you, but um, I appreciate that you take your time. And obviously, one of your staffers has joined uh, Sluha as a parliament uh, um, member of parliament. So there was a lot of talk uh, about political will of of Sluha to fix both the NABU problem and the other issues. Maybe you want to comment on that or select other issues to comment. We have kept you waiting for a very long time. So please go ahead. Thank you for inviting me. And I hope I heard now well because I have issues with Mike. I share the um, concerns of my colleagues, uh, which were present here on the floor. But now I think the issue what to do next. So that is why uh, we have to consider the next steps. And in, in this situation, the combination of efforts can be taken. Uh, this is the only way to deal in the reality. And uh, one of the issues, I believe, we we need to still communicate with the main stakeholders. In this situation, the main stakeholder is president and his head of the office. Uh, of course, people are not satisfied what's going on and there is a lot of uh, concerns. But what the option be to stay in the opposition and what and to do to do nothing? And I think it's counterproductive because. Uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't fight for the president and his uh, opinion, I think and other people will communicate him uh, opposite position, opposite views, and we will just lose our, our achievements. And I cannot say that I'm happy what's going on, but at the same time, I understand that uh, this is reality. And uh, alternative reality to this is just uh, to have total revenge and come back of pro-Russian political forces like Medvedchuk and. Uh, Party of region people now united and very good with numbers in local elections. And after local elections, they will fight for new parliamentary elections. And on the parliamentary elections, if it's going to happen in this year or next year, they will have control over a major majority and over the government. So this will, this will, the, you know, the, each next step makes situation worse and worse. That is why I propose to deal with reality, not to escalate the conflict, because we will lose this conflict. And the, to deal with reality, my opinion, again, we have to propose a proper list of candidates for the position and uh, to communicate with stakeholders saying that, OK, you took responsibility. I mean, office president, uh, you took responsibility for the selection of the SAP. Uh, now this is up to you to decide who will be this head of SAP. And we propose you a list from three candidates. Please make your choice. Have a, interview with these people. These people have no roots with the past. These people are not uh, corrupt. Uh, they are not uh, agent of Western influence. They're just good, proper prosecutors. And uh, in this, I, I believe this is the only way to deal in the reality. And um, by proposing this list, uh, at least we have the topic for communication because criticize, criticizing government, criticizing president, uh, it's very productive in political sense for opposition parties, but uh, it has no influence on the process, unfortunately. And uh, without influence on the process, we will have, again, what I told, revenge on the sliding back from the current achievements or previous achievements. And um, second option, I think the, we have to create a proper communication channel from the West to Ukraine. And uh, why not to consider the way to have special envoy as we had it uh, five, six years ago uh, when a few, few former politicians from European Parliament, uh, Mr. Cox and Mr. Kwasniewski was in this, were in this position, why not to consider some kind of special envoy now to propose this political position to stay in touch with president and at the same time to stay in touch with European leaders to save our achievements. This is what I think, uh, of course, are still present on the table, but uh, the issue, will these options be productive or counterproductive? All right. Thank you, Sehi, for this input. Um, I see you, Nastya, here, yeah, please. You're still muted. I'm sorry. Uh, colleagues, I, I just raised hands to say that unfortunately I have to leave for another meeting. Again, this, this was my uh, pleasure to share my opinions with you. Uh, I think organizers do have my contact. Uh, if I can be of any help providing information, assistance, whatever, please do not hesitate to contact me. I will be more than glad to uh, follow up and uh, cooperate in every useful aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining at your time is much appreciated. Goodbye.
we will continue for another maybe uh, 10 minutes if, if there are questions. So say he raised a couple of points that so he said that there are, that he proposed the creation of an envoy, establishing of an envoy. Of course, there are certain envoys. And the question is, maybe I can play this back um, to the other speakers. Is it really a lack of a communication channel or the substance of the message? Because my feeling is there's uh, several high ranking people. Germany has an envoy in, uh, itself. We have Mr. Milbrat, who is a special envoy for decentralization and the Ukrainian reform process. And Merkel speaks regularly with Schmichal and at times even with Zelensky. So the question is, is it a problem of the channels or the problem of the message from the West? I don't know who of you wants to uh, pick up this question. And if not, I'm looking at the other audience. Sehim, you um, or Yaroslav, who wants to comment on the question? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's not a problem of communication. It's, it's really a problem of very diplomatic message from the EU side. Uh, we need to, you know, to, to speak more openly and more directly. When we have problem, it's a problem. It's not a we deeply concern and other because uh, in our reality when you're talking with mr yermak or mr zelensky i totally agree with sergey that we must to fight for the mind for the thoughts of our government still we have possibility to uh, push them uh, on a western on pro-european pro-ukrainian uh, side but still uh, message must be more direct and more understandable for them because when we have visit and say, okay, in the, in the sphere of decentralization, we have not uh, so a uh, high result and we really wish to be more um, effective, it's not working in general. So if you do not done what you promise us, you will not receive uh, help uh, uh, on the next half year. The IMF were working in this way. The World Bank began to work in this way. Why? Because uh, uh, our, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it's not uh, only uh, describing of uh, Zelensky power, it's the uh, latest Poroshenko do the same way. They try to pretend that we do something. It's not, uh, but by the other hand, the attack what was done previously. So we need more direct and more understandable uh, message, uh, but I agree that, uh, that um, um, active communication will be more influential than uh, not, so, not, not so active. Good. Is, is, is there a question from the audience? I'm looking always at you. If not, I want to come back to Sehi and follow up on some things you, you said and others, other points that were mentioned. Uh, Yaroslav said the judiciary reform is frozen and today we focused mostly for good reasons on anti-corruption. But of course, the constitutional court verdict surprised many and it also raises the question how an unreformed judiciary poses a threat for gains of reforms in general, but in particular to the anti-corruption architecture. So maybe you can comment on the um, on the surprising rulings. And Nastya also alluded to uh, upcoming rulings on high anti-corruption court and on other crucial gains of the reform. So how do you evaluate the danger of an unreformed judiciary? Is it the uh, question to someone? Yeah. To, to you. <laughs> oh, to me, okay. So the legal reform is uh, unfortunately in deadlock now and uh, Again, I think uh, there is a, let's say how it looks from inside. I think the office of president looks for the uh, solution which will engage them in the process as less as possible. And uh, the people who propose this scenario, of course, they are not motivated by good, good results. I think they are just uh, trying to solve their own issues by uh, using the opportunity created by this moment and saying president and his office that, okay, it will be very good. These people will be un under your control and so on. But in reality, we saw from past that, uh, for instance, head of the district court, Mr. Wolf, he promised this, this is the same to all presidents. He promised this to Poroshenko. Now he promised this to Zelensky. 
uh, next time he will promise this to the successor of Zelensky saying that I'm working for you, but in, in, in reality working for himself. So what, what to do? I think that no, the main, no, we don't uh, have a problem with diagnosis now. So I think diagnosis is clear. The way what to do, the issue what to do. And uh, I think uh, it, this should be the topic uh, and uh, define the best solution is, is, is very good. I think Zelensky uh, is very different from previous president. He doesn't like to have mentor. He doesn't like to be blackmailed or pushed by, by someone from the West, but he would accept uh, good advice, proper advice from the people, especially if this advice goes from the same level. Like if he's achieved not by uh, head of department of European Union or not by uh, deputy minister, but chancellor or president of France or even vice president of United States, but someone equal to his level because he has this uh, issue that he has to be in communication with the proper uh, person uh, because uh, again, this is, uh, I don't uh, want to make an uh, evaluation, but I want to say that he has this feeling that Ukraine has to keep it, its sovereignty and nobody has right to push on Ukraine. That is why it has not, it should not be pressure. It should be conversation, open, frank conversation and way to engage him, uh, uh, explaining him pros and contras, saying that uh, your dream is not to be um, oligarch, but to be successful president with the uh, proper paragraph in the history book. And uh, your, your name would be on the name of the street of uh, Ukrainian streets. So you have to achieve this result. To achieve this result, you have to have like $10 billion from investment uh, and uh, another $10 billion from international uh, organization. To achieve this, you have to establish proper anti-corruption uh, sphere and we don't fight for names, we fight for, for the system. I think this was very good communication of European Union saying we're not fighting for Sydney, we're fighting for institution and its independence because On personal level, some people can be talking about institution. I think it's, it's better to communicate institutions because uh, unfortunately or fortunately, again, I don't want to make any opinion, but uh, Zelensky, the person who has personal view on the, on the, on, on the people, uh, maybe it's from his past to have personal opinion. And if he doesn't like Sitnik, it can make a problem for the whole NABU. In this sense, we have to communicate. Okay, you have an issue with Sitnik, but you have to understand that it's not his, uh, his institution. It's institution which has to be independent. That is why if you don't like uh, Holodinsky, let's find another, uh, again, what I'm proposing, short list of number of people who can be good for this institution. I'm now talking not just from uh, like um, my imagination, but I have example of uh, Ukrzaliznitsa, an Ukrainian railways uh, organization, which is number one employee in Ukraine. This is a state-owned company and there is uh, uh, 250,000 employees in this organization, uh, one of the big corrupt, uh, biggest corrupt institution. And we had selection process for sale and uh, I can say that we enjoyed very proper selection process with no pressure. We selected a proper leader of organization, Mr. Zmak, with, again, with no pressure. We made communication with Office of President. We introduced uh, candidates, not Mr. Zmak himself, but shortlist, all shortlist members were on the meeting with President. All of them had conversation, President had opinion. He understood that there is no backdoor game and he is a stakeholder of this process. And then decision was done and everyone is happy. And Mr. Zmak now started this tough reform process, what we were looking for decades in Ukrzaliznica. I wish uh, Mr. Zmak, the new leader of Ukrzaliznica, Ukrainian Railways, good luck with this. But I'm just explaining this as a good example how the whole process was constructed. International community was in supervisory board. Uh, supervisory board made on shortlist. Shortlist was presented to office of president. President had conversation with all members to, all together on the same stage, on the same podium. Uh, he made his opinion on this. President did not translate any opinion to the supervisory board. He even uh, by uh, making this opinion on the whole shortlist, he proposed another person to another position, another government level. So it means that it was for him as a casting for people to another positions as well. That is why I think it would be the same to make uh, opinion on special anti-corruption prosecutor, to make shortlist from five people 
propose them to president. And on Envoy, I think it has to be someone very high level. Right. And um, this is the way I, I, I just very last moment in 2012, when Yanukovych was president, we adopted a law on, on public uh, information. It was yes. impossible, but we achieved this because we found a way to communicate this with uh, Kalesnikov, Bondarenko, uh, all these crooks from Yanukovych time, but we expanded it. It's what you can put you as a word on your, on, your, on your jacket. This is very necessary for Ukraine to have this law and we adopt this law. And the same, I think we can do in, in current situations. These people are not worse than Yanukovych, believe me. And it's possible to communicate with them. All right, let's, let's wrap it up. Um, thank you, Sehi. This is important. Certainly the example of Mr. Schmack is, um, as it seems at the moment, an outlier in all the other institutions Customs service, tax service, and other institutions are also undermined. And maybe Ukrasalis needs to stand out as a positive example, but we should, in the next conversation, look at the other uh, institutions. And of course, key is who selects the shortlist, right? The Zelensky does the casting, as you called it, but the key is who selects the shortlist. And that um, drawing on Nabu's experience in 2015 or the 2019, I believe, experience of the High Anti Corruption Court should involve at least very high and clear integrity criteria and maybe even involvement of international experts that can veto any of the um, foul uh, proposed candidates. But um, I see still a raised hand of Marie Louise. So do you want to have the last word or Marie Louise? No, Marie Louise, then we wrap it up. And I just want to say thank you. This is a very complex matter. Uh, for those uh, reading uh, German, there are quite some here in the audience. I can only recommend the previous edition of the Ukraine Analyse and focused on Ukraine's judiciary, which we haven't talked about too much because it's another complex uh, area for itself. So today's discussion was mostly on anti-corruption. I want to thank um, all speakers which are still here. Tatiana, thank you so much for your valuable input. Um, Nastya already disappeared, Sehi. Your input and opinion is much appreciated and Yaroslav, of course, also your contributions are highly valued. So we will take the information and relay them uh, back to the foreign ministry and the chancellor and the stakeholders in Berlin to be tougher on Zelensky where it needs to be, but in a constructive, as say he was saying, in a constructive way and on the highest possible level. So with that said, thank you so much everybody for attending and uh, we look forward to engaging you again, hopefully in person in Berlin or in Kiev. So stay healthy and um, uh, go goodbye. Back up.